Arizona Wildlife Views, brought to you by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and the Heritage Fund, lottery dollars working for wildlife. Some projects made possible by the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Fund. Hello and welcome to Arizona Wildlife Used. I'm your host, Jim Harkin. Tonight, we get a rare inside look at the Adobe Mountain Wildlife Center. Then we head to Southern Arizona for a family-friendly camping and hunting experience where the youngsters go in search of the elusive wabbit. Then we head to the east and see how the endangered blacktail prairie dog is making a comeback. But first, we head to the Robbins Butte area near Buckeye to see how an endangered species and a group of troubled youth are helping to save each other. A sunny afternoon in November was a day of new beginnings for both man and fish at Robbins Butte Wildlife Area. The fish are Gila top minnow and desert pupfish. Both species are native to Arizona and are on the federal endangered species list. The young men are from the Eagle Point School Juvenile Correctional Facility and they are working to make their futures brighter than their pasts. If you've talked to some of these kids, it's been a cycle. Uh, mom's in jail or dad's in jail, uh, mom's in a gang, they grew up in the gang, so the grand gang life is what they, they've never seen anything outside the gang life. Programs like this give them an opportunity to see that there's an opportunity to break the cycle, um, that they can break the cycle. Um, changing, uh, change starts with one. Uh, that's one of our, that's one of our, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, one of our big sayings, change begins with one, you know. Are you the one? The young men assisting the biologists are part of the Skills for Work program, which gives high achieving youth at the facility the opportunity to learn new skills, gain work experience, and build confidence and self-esteem. Basically, the kids that are in this program are all the top performers uh, off of our facility. Uh, and they're usually within three to four months of a release. That's why this is real important. It gives them some job skills or something they could kind of fall back on hopefully once they get out of here. Phil Smith, the manager of the wildlife area, along with his constant companion Chewbacca, work with the participants so they can get the most out of their experience here. We've got a group of anywhere from four to six young men that come in with a, uh, a, a supervisor and Mondays and Fridays uh, generally, but a couple times a week we get them in for three hours and we go out through all the wildlife areas throughout and do things such as build concrete structures, water management structures, uh, just uh, trimming trees, um, building, uh, working with uh, some of our trail systems. Uh, the, the boys get a, an opportunity to do real life skills and of course they get a chance to see wildlife too and uh, with their questions and the learning education that goes on uh, these youngsters get out of their system and uh, they're, they're a whole, a better person to get back into society and have a great chance then to take off and know they can accomplish things. They don't have to go back into the, the, the other life that they came from. With state budgets being what they are, there is always the chance that programs like Skills for Work will go away. Lawrence Simpson, who works with these boys every day, hopes that doesn't happen. The biggest danger of this, uh, for, for me personally, and the people that work in the program with me was that these kids would leave this facility with some tools, but no realistic tools. Uh, some abilities, but not the ability or the, uh, uh, the courage to go out there and really look for a job, which we, uh, these kids get told by the people they work for that they've done a good job. You know, and hey, if you want to use my name, uh, you want to give me a call when you get out, you know, to see if, as a reference, do that. This is, and these kids are building confidence. That's one of the biggest things, they build confidence. Before the native fish could be brought to Robbins Butte for release, the ponds had to be properly prepared, and that involves a lot of plain hard work. Well, some of the ponds, especially this one, it's a cement-based pond, so we had a lot of mud and scum and, and stuff that was in, the, in there that might have eggs or some of the non-native issues that we wanted to get rid of. So we drained the ponds, and these boys got in there and, and scooped out mud and 
uh, got most of the majority of that out. And then when it dried up, they were in there with brooms and, and scrubbing by hand. And uh, they've gone around the area here and cleaned it up and made it uh, just a presentable, nice presentable area to come and enjoy coming and watching the fish, just to come look at them. Yeah, it was a dirty, dirty, filthy job, but it was exciting because I never really done concrete and step by step, Mr. Phil and Jack. If it wasn't for them, I don't know how I could get such jobs like that done. And thanks to them, I got step by step, I got taught in how to do it. And it was pretty, you know, it was kind of hectic sometimes, but it was okay overall. It was, it was a good experience. On this day, about 600 Gila top minnow and 130 desert pupfish are being readied for their new home. These small native fish were once common throughout most of the Gila Basin, but are now found only in a fraction of their historic range. Listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act, this is the first time that these fish will be released in a state wildlife area as part of the Safe Harbor Agreement. The Safe Harbor program, is, uh, it's been uh, quite an episode to try and get, get that accomplished, but what it does is provide uh, just that, a safe harbor. We can provide these ponds here on the Gammon Fish property and not be liable for loss of the fish. We, of course, we manage them to the best of our abilities, but if uh, something comes in and starts eating on the fish or w there's an emergency and the ponds have to be drained, why then we're not going to be in trouble for losing these native fish, which are uh, normally, in, in that case, you are in trouble if you cause the death of these fish. Since the young men worked so hard to help repair the ponds, it was only fitting that they were also on hand to help release the fish, although it was a little more complicated than they had anticipated. Uh, it, it's a good experience. I, I worked with fish before, which is fishing, but nothing like this about the temperature and all that and seeing. I thought it was just, I never thought that you had to take this whole procedures to put fish in the water. I thought you just get a bucket and dump them in, but I see you have to take other steps to provide stuff from happening and to put the fish in the water. I like it a lot. Once the temperature in the ponds matched the temperature in the coolers full of fish, they were finally ready to be moved into their new home. The fish from these ponds will provide a nursery to supply other areas of the state and help in their recovery. Likewise, the work being done here by these young men will hopefully lead to the recovery of their life skills as well. It's a wonderful feeling personally. Uh, I've had a, a wonderful life in, in bringing youth into the outdoors up to through, through now. And, and when we can have an outreach like this on the Game of Fish property uh, to where they're, again, going back into society with a, a better understanding and, and appreciation for the good things that are out there in life. They see some things that people do that, that aren't so good and they shake their heads. Now these are guys in the system that are wondering how could anybody do this kind of damage. So it's, it's an awesome feeling to have these youngsters come up to me, ask me for a reference in their future, ask me if they can come back out, bring their kids out and show these, their kids what they've done and what they've accomplished out here. They're proud of it. And it, personally, that's just a, it, it means a, a lot. It, it's part of the day that you can walk away and feeling good and head high about. Feeling good about the work we do is important to all of us. And working with sick and injured wildlife is especially rewarding. So come behind the scenes with us and meet the people and the animals of the Adobe Mountain Wildlife Center. Once a year, the Arizona Game and Fish Department offers a rare glimpse into the world of wildlife with a free open house at the Adobe Mountain Wildlife Center. We have 28 species of bats. If all those bats did the exact same thing, there wouldn't be enough resources for those bats to live. I think it's extremely important for a couple reasons. We watch TV, we see all kinds of neat animals in Africa and people say, oh, what a great idea. I would love to go there someday if I could ever afford it to see it. And everybody is mesmerized and in love with all these animals somewhere other than here in Arizona. Arizona is such a rich state when it comes to wildlife. We have so many reptiles, so many mammals, and so many birds. Because of our diverse habitats here in Arizona, most people, you know, it's like, you don't know what's in your own backyard, and that's the problem. The Adobe Mountain Wildlife Center is a wildlife triage, treatment, and rehabilitation facility operated by Arizona Game and Fish in cooperation with the center's nonprofit auxiliary. When first founded in 1983, its original focus was treating and rehabilitating sick and injured wildlife and returning those that are able back to the wild. 
Many people bring us animals that are injured or they're young uh, and the first thing we need to do is do a complete evaluation and determine what their problems are, if any, and or what we need to do with them. Whether it's an animal we can keep here and then relocate or if it's an animal that needs to go to another rehabilitation facility because they specialize with those or they have a better setting. So, so we can be the hub of a lot of different opportunities with rehabilitation as well as our education. But number one focus is health of animals, whether it's animals that come in through re for rehabilitation or animals that we hold on site for our education outreach programs. The animals that find their way to the center are often victims of an accidental encounter with humans, such as this bald eagle that was hit by a car. Sadly, many of them are taken illegally from the wild to be raised as pets and end up here when their owners turn them in or they are confiscated by law enforcement. Wild animals that have become dependent on humans can never be released back into the wild. Now, the difference between the Swainson's hawk and a red-tailed hawk, when you're looking at them or you want to see them up close like this, is that the red-tailed hawk has what we call a, a, a skirt, a bridle. It's not the bib, it's the girdle or the middle part that's darker. We still have to maintain the facilities that we have here, not only for rehabilitation, but also for caring for the animals that we keep that we use on our education permits. Whether it is mammals, whether it is raptors, whether it is any kind of other bird, such as the turkey vulture or the raven or the crow, and then we also have to make sure that we maintain the health of these animals that we use in our education outreach. So the hospital is an integral part. During the open house weekend, visitors are allowed to stroll through the facility at their own pace and observe all the animals currently on site. They are also treated to informative wildlife presentations, a fishing clinic, and all kinds of information about recreating in the outdoors. Growing up in Arizona when I was a child, there were many, many opportunities for young people to go outside, to learn how to be responsible in the wild. But back when I was a child, things were different. Parents tended to work five days a week, and on weekends the family could pack up and go camping in the White Mountains, or go camping up on the rim, or, or go to Prescott, or different areas of the state. And I think that's become more and more challenging for, for people today, as lifestyles have changed and parents are working, the economy has shifted to the point where it's difficult for children now to have those opportunities. More than 1,000 sick or injured animals are brought to the center each year. And while they continue to provide immediate treatment and rehabilitation services, their focus has shifted more toward wildlife education. This open house at Adobe Mountain gives families a, a free option for that where they can bring their children out. If they as parents don't have the time or the resources or the knowledge to know how to get their kids vested in the wild and how to be outdoors and be outdoors responsibly, we have the educators here that can help with that. We have a tremendous educational division within the department that spends the year working with teachers, working with children, working with outreach efforts. And Adobe Mountain is, it can be the focal point of that. Adobe Mountain can be that one weekend a year when the public can come out and learn firsthand. The Adobe Mountain Wildlife Center is supported by donations and outside funds. So it receives no taxpayer money and has only one full-time employee. Everyone else that's out here is a volunteer. They volunteer their time, they volunteer their efforts, their skills, their knowledge in helping me keep the animals safe, helping me have the pins in the right way, the special diets, the medical treatments, the education outreach. We need people who want to take our animals with them into the field, whether it be for a education in the classroom setting, whether it's for an exhibit that we put out in the community. We try to reach as many people as we can who wouldn't even think about wildlife. The open house is free to the public with the hope that as Arizonans learn more about the wildlife of their state, they will have a greater understanding and desire to help preserve it. If you want to reconnect, if you want to be able to go out and fish, and you want to be able to go out or even bird watch, or just be outdoors responsibly, the Arizona Game and Fish Department has a program to give you a stepping stone towards that goal. Adobe Mountain plans to open its doors to the public every year on the weekend before Thanksgiving. Passing on our hunter heritage often begins when a parent or mentor gets the opportunity to spend some quality time with a youngster in the field. Our next story takes us to a camp that was set up for that very reason. We're hunting weapons. 
Wabbits? Well, not exactly. But antelope and black-tailed jackrabbits were definitely in the sights of some very special hunters in the Alter Valley, southwest of Tucson. This is the, um, the second annual junior jack camp where we're getting a lot of kids out and teach them how to hunt jackrabbits, teach them a little bit about jackrabbit ecology and biology, how to hunt jackrabbits, it's awful fun, um, how to clean them, how to, how to reduce the meat and, and bring it in so you've got nice clean meat to cook. And then we also provide a, a recipe book where we give them a lot of recipes to try. And some of the people that have been to the jack camp last year have told me in the intervening year, two things, not only ha has their kid been so excited about hunting because he really got an introduction in jack camp, they went on to get javelina tags and javelina, and in some cases an elk. Junior jack camp is a fun camping and hunting experience that is completely free of charge for the participants. 18 youngsters between the ages of 10 and 14 and their adult partners spent the weekend together enjoying the great outdoors. Once they arrived, everyone enjoyed the fun of setting up their own camp. Sean Duell and his sons Adam and Archer had been looking forward to this trip for weeks. I think the number one thing for me is just that I get to spend time with my boys. It's uh, where everybody's busy and lots of things to do and when you're out hunting, whether it's hiking with a purpose is what we call it, you know, and we get to carry the firearms and have a purpose for it. But being outside and seeing the, uh, how, the beauty of it and just spending time together and talking and camping of course and it's those are special times I think for me I'm looking for experiences that the boys will have long-term good memories of as we as we grow up together. Along with their dad Adam and Archer also had Arizona game and fish biologist Jim Heffelfinger as their hunting guide to help them track and learn the signs of jackrabbits in the area. After taking a large dose of patience and getting only an occasional glimpse of their prey, they finally spotted a jack out in the open and were able to set their sights. On this day, the jackrabbits were quicker than the boys. But back at camp, other young hunters were proudly displaying their trophies, including Annie Seiler, who brought down two jacks that were almost as large as she was. Eight pounds. Nine ounces and five eighths. We walked around a little bit. Well, in the beginning I got the first one. It was really neat. I shot it and just fell. I missed the first shot, but I got the second time. And that was really cool. Uh, at first I was thinking, did I miss it or did I get it? Turns out I got it because it fell down. And. Uh, we walked around a little bit more, found another one. Um, it was behind us and I found it and I shot that one too. Like all hunting activities, safety is the first order of business. All of the youngsters had to complete a hunter safety course prior to the hunt and wear a blaze orange hat or vest to make them more visible when in the field. The evening before the hunt, they received a lesson in jackrabbit biology and what to expect in the field. Each group had its own experienced guide and they fanned out over a large area to keep plenty of distance between the hunters. Kids come free, all of the food is, uh, is provided and uh, get to spend uh, a weekend hunting jackrabbits and learning about jackrabbits and learning about hunting jackrabbits and, and um, it's something that we can do to, to try to get kids uh, in kind of an entry-level position to start hunting something that, that's not like trying to hunt elk and not like trying to hunt white-tailed deer down here, but they get a chance to see a lot of jackrabbits, get a couple shots, practice their marksmanship skills, practice their sneaking and their stalking skills, and getting a good solid rest and making a shot. So it has all the elements of, of a perfect entry-level hunt for kids to, to really get, get their, their foot in the door. Oh, lucky rabbit. Is that from this morning? Uh-huh. By the end of the camp, 31 jacks had been harvested, including a huge 10-pound, 8-ounce beast that went into the stew pot that night. Of course, events like this are only possible because of the dozens of volunteers who donate the camp kitchen, the food, hunting supplies, expertise, and most importantly, their time. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a real feel-good story. Um, my, my dad took me out, you know, when I was 8 years old, and, and uh, um, uh, I kind of took it for granted, you know, that, that, that it, was, it was what I was meant to do. And, and you see some of these kids now that, that are city kids, 
um, that have never had this opportunity and they come back and they see the fun that they've had and the look on their face and the proudness of they, that they have that you, you, you made a difference in one child and knowing that they're going to take this to school, they're going to take it home, they're going to think about this forever and, and, uh, and, and you got a possible hunter there for the rest of their life. Next year, the Junior Jack Camp should only get bigger and better as more families want to participate in this great outdoor experience. Active management of wildlife populations is absolutely necessary for the conservation of any wildlife species, but game and fish can't do it alone. Travel down to the Los Cienegas National Conservation Area and meet some dedicated researchers from the University of Arizona as they release and study black-tailed prairie dogs. Just two years after being reintroduced to the state after nearly a 50-year absence, black-tailed prairie dogs are showing positive signs of re-establishing themselves across part of their historical range in southern Arizona. First-time prairie dog releaser Liz Urban thinks it's a really cool experience. That was great. I've never handled uh, prairie dogs before, so that was an adventure. And it was cool to be able to introduce them to a new place where hopefully they'll do well and reproduce and repopulate. Even facing eventual freedom, these guys were still a handful. Yep, that second one definitely had a little bit of an attitude, but I can't blame them. Uh, over there under the tent, they are uh, marking these individuals before we release them. So they're getting ear tags and then hair dye numbers on the side so that observers can tell them apart once they're introduced. So they're being weighed and just make sure that their health and sex and everything, we have all that information. Monitoring studies indicate that the animals are breeding at both of the previous reintroduction sites with at least 16 pups observed this spring. Now, the Arizona Game and Fish Department and Bureau of Land Management furthered the effort to repopulate the species with the release of 119 prairie dogs at a third site in the Los Cienegas National Conservation Area near Sonoida. As part of the latest release, the University of Arizona placed earmarks and fur dye on all of the animals as part of a study on survivorship. U of A researcher Sarah Hale explains. Well, we're mainly going to be monitoring the black tails once they're released, behavior-wise, dispersal, survival, and pretty much everything we can find out from them because they haven't really been studied in the site. Yeah, we're taking weights first. 1.25, and then we're sexing them to see if they're male or female. Male. And then we put ear tags on them so we can keep track of individuals and give them a unique marker. And we're just doing numbers right now. So each prairie dog has a different number and we can observe and see which individuals go where and specifically what each one does. To get the individual numbers applied, the researchers need to be part biologist, part sleight of hand expert, and part hairdresser. This is the hair dye that we're using on the prairie dogs. I think it's Lady Clairol. Something like that. <laughs> well, we could have used those and we could use paintbrushes too. We just didn't have those with us, so <laughs> improvising. <laughs> They're also taking untreated hair samples for another part of the study. Oh yeah, we're taking hair samples in case we want to do DNA analysis to see how they're genetically related and which offspring are related to which adults, hopefully when they have offspring next season. The animals used to re-establish black-tailed prairie dogs in Arizona are chosen based on their similar genetics to the population that previously existed in the state. The prairie dogs are placed into acclimation cages, which are used to prevent the animals from dispersing too quickly upon release and to allow them to adjust to their new environment. In time, the animals will burrow themselves out of the acclimation cages and be free to establish an underground network of tunnels. Black-tailed prairie dogs are one of Arizona's two native prairie dog species. The other species, which is found in northern Arizona, is the Gunnison's prairie dog. Historically, the black-tailed prairie dog was the most widely distributed of the five prairie dog species and were commonly found in southeastern Arizona. Human-related factors, including poisoning and habitat fragmentation, greatly reduced their numbers range-wide over the last 150 years. 
That's our show for this evening. If you have questions about anything you saw on the show, or you'd like to sign up for the latest e-newsletter, check out our website at azgfd.gov. For producers Gary Schaefer and Carol Lind, I'm your host Jim Harkin. Thanks for watching.